right, we're going to look at chapter nine joints, and we're going to we're going to split this into two lectures. We're going to have one lecture about the anatomy and the structure, and then we're going to then have a second video about more of the motions from the joints. So joint classification, guys, we need to first know what a joint is. It's an articulation or what we call an arthrosis. This is where two bones are going to come together. This can be between a bone and a bone directly. It could be between bone and a cartilage with another bone, okay? Um, or it could be between your teeth and your bone. Arthrology is the study of the joints, joint diseases, and treatments. And so if somebody is going to go to the doctor for arthritis, um, that's an autoimmune issue, whereas osteoarthritis is more degenerative wear and tear. So there's different types of diseases that deal with the joints. We also see kinesiology, though, is the study of the movement of the human body. So guys, joint structure is directly linked to joint function. Okay, so it's very linked and related. And so if a joint is no, has no movement or it's inflexible, it's going to be stronger than a joint that is more freely flexible. Okay, so if it's going to be kind of like cemented together with no movement, it's obviously gonna be stronger. Loosely fitted joints though have a greater movement, but they're also more prone to dislocation or displace. Now, if we look here, this is an example with a displacement or dislocation. This is showing you a very flexible joint, one that has, is loosely fitted together, which is the shoulder. The first picture show, shows you a normal sh shoulder joint. The second shows you a dislocated shoulder. This is where the humerus head, the head of the humerus has been popped out of the socket, so it's not coming in contact with the glenoid fossa like we see that it should. And this last picture is showing you how a shoulder is separated. It's separated when you look here that the clavicle has detached from the scapula. This is if the ligament is torn and it pops on up. So there's different ways that these shoulder joints or even any joint could be displaced. Now flexibility is also known as your range of motion or your ROM. These are going to be affected by a number of things. Um, the shape of the articulating bones are going to determine how flexible or movable the joint is. If we look here, which joint has more range of motion, the shoulder or the knee? Well, based on the structure, that's the shoulder. Okay, the shoulder allows for that ball and socket type of joint, and so it's able to move in lots of different directions. We also see that the flexibility of your ligaments, the bone to bone connection is going to um, influence your flexibility and also the tension of your muscles and tendons. That whole idea of muscle to bone is also going to potentially limit your flexibility. Another thing that can also affect it is hormones. Hormones such as a relaxant can actually cause the ligaments in like the woman's pelvis to start to relax and that way that the bones can actually separate for the childbirthing process. So this hormone is not present very often but it is going to be released prior to childbirth. Another one is disuse. You've probably heard the term, if you don't use it, you'll lose it, and flexibility is one of those things. If you do not utilize those muscles and stretch them out, we do see that disuse is going to be an issue with your flexibility. This is one reason, guys, when we talk about flexibility um, and tension and use, it's really important to stretch your muscles before exercise because that also stretch out, st stretches out your joints. Now joints can be classified by their structure, that's the anatomy side, but they could also but they could also be classified by their function, which is the physio physiology side. So structural classifications are based on the presence or absence of what we call a synovial cavity, but we also are gonna look at the type of connective tissue that binds the joint together. So when we look at this first type of joint, this is a fibrous joint, there's no synovial cavity, and this is gonna be made of dense connective tissue. Lots of collagen in here, and this is where the bones are almost cemented together like we see in the sutures in the skull. We then see cartilaginous types of structural joints. They still have no synovial cavity, but this is gonna be where cartilage is between the bones. This could be hyaline cartilage or fibrocartilage. An example here is the pubic symphysis between the coxal bones. A synovial joint is the one that actually has the synovial membrane. The synovial membrane is going to allow for fluid to be in this cavity, and this is going to reduce friction and increase movement. So in C, you can see that there is a capsule around the joint, and that is the synovial capsule or cavity. Now let's look at the functional classifications. This is based on the degree of movement that they permit. So when we talk about a synarthrosis joint, it's immovable, and this would be example with A. A, a fibrous joint that's tightly packed together is going to be immovable, so it is a synarthrosis. 
When we look at an amparthrosis, this joint's gonna be slightly movable, and the example here would be the cartilaginous joint for B. There allows for some little bit of movement, but not very much. A diarthrosis type of joint is freely movable, and these are gonna be your synovial joints for C. So if you notice here, the structure is gonna directly relate to the movement for the function. So let's look at structural classifications with the functions in mind, okay? So the functions are going to be in the red. So a fibrous joint, remember, is a tight articulation with dense connective tissue. Some examples of this are going to be a suture, which we just talked about, the ones between the cranial bones or the skull bones. These are immovable in adults. We also see what we call a syndesmosis. This is going to be a distal articulation that happens between the tibia and fibula. You can see it located down here at the bottom. This is gonna be slightly movable, but not much. It's more for stability. We also see a gomphosis. A gomphosis is between your tooth root and the alveolar process for the, of the socket. This is gonna be either in the maxilla or the mandible, and these are supposed to also be immovable. I mean, your teeth need to stay in your, in your jaw. Sometimes, though, they can get knocked out with force or disease can affect them. The last one are the interosseous membranes. These are found between the radius and the ulna and the tibia and fibula. This is a sheet of fibrous tissue that binds the two bones together so that they move together. They're slightly movable, but wherever the radius goes, the ulna is gonna go. And the same thing with the fibula and the tibia. Okay, so these are just some examples of those fibrous types of joints. And if you'll notice, the function, when we look at movement, is very limited for these. The cartilaginous joints, when we look at these, some examples are going to be, or cartilaginous joints are gonna be tight articulations, but they're gonna have cartilage present, either hyaline or fibrocartilage. Some examples are what we call a synchondrosis. This is hyaline cartilage connecting material of the epiph epiphyseal growth plates between the epiphysis and the diaphysis of the bones. These are immovable and eventually these do become ossified and they go away. Okay, so this is when the growth plates do start to close. Another example are a symphysis type of joint. This is gonna be hyaline and fibrocartilage connecting material. This occurs like in a midline of our body. An example is the pubic symphysis, but also our intervertebral joints. Okay, so those discs, those cartilage discs that are between each of our vertebrae are gonna be an example of this. And they are slightly movable, okay, in their function. Now, structural classification, when we look at synovial joints, are the freely movable joints. And they're gonna provide a variety of motions. Now there's different types of synovial joints and we're gonna hit on these. These include a plane, hinge, pivot, condyloid, saddle, and ball and socket. So we're gonna start with the plane first. So when we look at a plane synovial joint, this joint is going to allow for gliding movements for a side to side and back to forth movement. So this is going to have a biaxial movement to where they can move in the two different directions. This occurs between the carpal, carpals of your wrist and the tarsals of your ankle. So they allow for a sliding to take place, okay, but it's not gonna be this huge amount of movement because they are closely packed together. The next type of joint is the hinge joint. The hinge joint is an opening and closing movement and it has one axis of movement and so it's gonna be a back and forth that movement. This permits flexion and extension. You find this in your knees, your elbows, your ankles, and your interphalanges. So when we talk about your interphalanges, it's your fingers so they can do this number. Okay, so they can bend down. All right, so this is what we're seeing for a hinge joint. A pivot joint is going to be where there's a rotational movement that happens. Now, it's not gonna be where it can rotate all the way around, but it does allow for some rotation. One example of this is the um, antelo-axial joint, which is going to be between your vertebrae one and vertebrae two, and this allows you to say no. Okay, so going from side to side. We also see that this is the radial ulnar joint where the radius fits in with the ulna and it allows for you to be able to supinate your hand, but also turn it over and pronate, okay? So it's allowing for that pivot to take place for your hand. The next one is the condyloid joint. This is a side to side and back to forth, but also what we would call elliptical movement. So there is a biaxial. This is between your wrist and your radius. So when we're talking about your hand here, it allows you to be able to kind of do circles with your wrist, okay? It's also gonna be at your metacarpals, which are these knuckle joints right here. It allows you to be able to move your finger as well in like a circle, okay? So these are what we call condyloid joints. 
The next one's the saddle joint. A saddle joint allows for a side to side and back to forth, so a biaxial movement. And this is going to be seen with your thumb and your carpal. Okay, this is the only saddle joint that you have and it allows you to be able to do this movement. Okay, being able to pull your thumb over across your hand. The last, when we talk about the synovial joints, is going to be the ball and socket. The ball and socket, guys, prevents movement in multiple directions. So this is what we consider a multi-axial plane or multi-axial joint. This would be your shoulder or your hip. It's going to have lots of ways you can move. So if we look at your shoulder, we can go, you know, from side to side. You can go in circles around. Okay, there's a lot of different things that you can end up doing with your shoulder. Your hip the same way, although you cannot circle it all the way around, okay, due to the structure, but it does have a lot more movement than, say, your knee or your elbow. All right, so here's like a little quiz it's naming the joint that's present here. Your choices are hinge, pivot, plane, condyloid, saddle, and ball and socket. And these are going to be some x-rays from the hand. So if we look at A, what kind of joint is A? A would be a hinge joint. It's the one that allows you to move your finger like this, okay? When we look at B, B is going to be these joints right here with your knuckles, so these are condyloid. When we look at C, C is for your thumb, so this is your saddle joint. D is between the carpals, which is going to be a plane. And then E is between the carpals and the radius, which is going to be a condyloid joint as well. So in your hand, you have lots of different joints that are present. However, you don't have a ball and socket or a pivot present in your hand. So right here is an overview of the structural and functional classifications of the joints. It shows you the joint type, like synarthrosis. It tells you the function that it's immovable, and it gives you some examples, suture, gomphosis, and synchrondrosis. On the other hand, we have the ampiarthrosis. Those are slightly movable. This is going to be your syndesmosis or your symphysis. And diarthrosis are freely movable joints, which is the synovial joints. Now, the bottom chart gives you the joint type, but it then shows you the structure. And then it also gives you some examples. So we have a fibrous joint is going to be with dense connective tissue. This is going to be sutures, desmosomes, gomphosis, or interosseous membranes. Cartilaginous joints have the hyaline or fibrocartilage, which means they have synchrondrosis or the symphysis. And then the diarthrosis joints, of course, have the synovial joints, and this is going to be the plane, hinge, pivot, condyloid, saddle, and ball and socket. All right, so this gives you just kind of an overview of what we just talked about on the, f the previous slides. All right, so the second part I want to talk to you about is the anatomy of the synovial joint. Because it is more complex, it has this cavity around it, we do see that there's going to be more um, structures, and so we want to take a closer look at this. So when we talk about the articular or joint capsule, we see that it is going to surround the joint like you see in this picture. It encloses a synovial cavity. This cavity or opening is going to be full of fluid, and it's going to unite the two articulating bones. Now the outer part of this membrane, because it is a two membrane type of system, just like we saw with the serous membranes earlier in chapter one, it's going to have an outer fibrous capsule. This is going to be made out of dense connective tissue. The collagen gives it strength and flexibility to resist stretching so that the bones still stay in contact, okay, where the joint stays intact. This resists stretching, but it also is going to have some fibers that form ligaments that are going to connect the bone to the bone. You can see that here in the picture. The inner synovial membrane is going to be made out of loose connective tissue, areolar specifically, and it's going to have a lot more elastic fibers. This is going to allow for when it moves, it's going to give a little bit more flexibility on the inner part of the joint. Now the synovial fluid is the fluid that's found inside of the cavity. This fluid has a number of different um, functions. It is viscous. It has a clear to pale yellow color. However, it does become less viscous during movement. Now guys, viscous is how well it flows. Okay, so water is going to be where it flows very easily, whereas maple syrup or honey does not. Okay, maple syrup and honey is more viscous. It's thicker. Now, your synovial fluid is not as thick as like maple syrup, but it is thicker than water. However, when we heat it up as through movements, it does become less viscous. It gets thinner in the process. Okay, so this is why it's important to warm up before exercising. We do see that this fluid is going to contain phagocytes. They're going to remove debris and micros from the area, so they're going to help keep it clean. We also see that it's going to have hyaluronic acid, which is a connective tissue binder. 
And then there's, of course, interstitial fluid. This is going to be the fluid that is going to exchange nutrients and waste with the chondrocytes. Because recall when we talked about cartilage, chondrocytes, they are going to be avascular. There's no direct blood source here. And so this fluid is going to allow for that exchange to take place. The function of the synovial fluid is to lubricate the joint and to also act as a shock absorber to allow it to be more movable and flexible. Now, there are some times where something can get embedded into this fluid, and gout is an example. This is where uric acid is going to collect in the synovial fluid, and it looks like little shards of glass underneath the microscope. This causes inflammation in the joint, and this is a type of arthritis. Gout a lot of times can be controlled, though, based on your diet, because uric acid is going to be made in higher abundance with certain kinds of foods like red meat. Now, other structures that are associated with synovial joints are going to include some accessory ligaments. These accessory ligaments are going to be things like the extra capsular ligaments. These mean they're outside of the capsule, okay? They're not gonna be inside the, the actual synovial joint capsule, they're outside. These are going to be what we call collateral ligaments. And here in this picture, this is showing you the knee. We see that there is what we would call the medial collateral ligament and the lateral collateral ligament. These are known as the MCL and LCL. And you may have heard of somebody who said that they strained that or torn that. It means that they've torn those ligaments that are connecting the femur to the tibia or fibula. Okay, so this is causing some issues with that extra capsular ligaments. Okay, we also see that there's some intracapsular ligaments. These are gonna be inside the capsule. And again, in the knee, we see that these are going to be known as the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament, and the PCL, the posterior cruciate ligament. Okay, so these are actually in the synovial cavity, but they are connecting the bones to each other. Now, a sprain and a strain are two different things, not just the fact that they're spelled differently. When we talk about a sprain, this is where a ligament gets stretched and it can tear. This is gonna happen a lot of times in the wrist or the ankle, but there's no dislocation that takes place. In a strain, we see that there is a muscle and or tendon that gets stretched or torn. So there is a difference. A sprain deals with ligaments, a strain deals with muscles and tendons. Now, you'll notice in some of these joints, there's gonna be an articular disc called a meniscus that's present. This is fibrocartilage pads that are between the two bones so that it's not bone on bone that's occurring. There's a cushion that's here, okay? And this is going to help with that whole idea of the fluidity of the movement as well so it's not grinding. However, these meniscus can get torn like in the knee. If somebody says they had a torn cartilage in their knee, this means they had a meniscus tear. Um, this can re be repaired with um, arthroscopy type surgery where they just go in with the cameras and clip off the torn part of the cartilage. Now, nerve supply and blood supply are abundant to the tissues of the articular joint, but they do not have direct access to the cartilage because remember, cartilage is a vascular. Now, there are some fluid-filled structures outside of the synovial joint that we want to discuss, and the point of these fluid-filled structures are all to help reduce friction, all right? Because when we rub two things together, heat can be created, and that causes friction. When we move our joints, we don't want that to occur, and so these structures help reduce that problem. We do see that there's some things called bursa. These are sac-like structures, and they're gonna be between the skin and your bones, um, tendons and bones, muscles and bones, and ligaments and bones. And the whole point is to help provide that cushion and a sliding process to happen. Um, if these get inflamed, they are you do have what we call bursitis. We also see that there can be tendon sheaths that wrap around the tendon as a, and it helps it be able to slide a little bit better over surface over surfaces. You can see we have some of these tendon sheets, especially in the wrist area and the ankle. And if these get inflamed, they are called um, tenosynovitis. And this is something kind of similar to like tennis elbow.